Hey everybody, welcome back. This is Advanced 6, uh, part of Part 5 in, modulo, uh, in uh, Module 1, and this is the question Modulo. Now we've been using Modulo as a way to determine if a number is even or odd, and Modulo gives us the remainder after dividing a number by another number. Uh, now they've got a bunch of um, notes for us here. They call it canonical documentation on MDN uh, for the remainder operator. You can peruse those at your leisure, but for now we're just going to um, kind of walk through the problem. To be sure, this is arguably one of the hardest problems in all of prep, uh, definitely in all of module one, and again, arguably in all of prep, uh, mostly because figuring out how to solve this is relatively tricky, but we're gonna follow the same pattern that we have previously, which is to say the first thing we do, read the problem fully and see if there's any edge cases. So they don't want us to use the modulo operator, obviously that's why it's difficult, but they have this set of uh, edge cases, which is to say modulo always returns the sign of the first number is not necessarily an edge case, but uh, taking note of the notes is a good idea. So zero modulo any number is equal to zero. Any number modulo zero is not a number. If either operand is not a number, then the result is not a number. So let's start with those. First thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna say if num1 is equal to zero, we're going to return zero. Now you might be thinking, uh, the way that these two are set up are not completely conclusive, which is to say that what about zero divided by, or zero modulo not a number. Uh, theoretically, the way that we're gonna write this, it might not handle that. So the order of these edge cases is, uh, it's, it's not exactly easy to determine what would be the, uh, what, what the idea is here. Um, so in the event that our edge cases are misaligned, we'll just move them around a little bit. So let's get the edge cases on the page. If num2 is equal to zero, then we want to return not a number. And see how not a number glows orange because it's actually a value. Um, it's a falsy value if you remember what truthy and falsy is, but for our purposes, it, it's JavaScript's way of being like, I think you want a number, but I can't generate one from what you did. Uh, if you were to like say two plus undefined, which a lot of people will do from time to time when trying to access an array outside of bounds, it'll be like, hey, I'm uh, pretty sure that you wanted a number, but I don't have one, so here's this not a number sort of signifier. Similarly, we can't really say num2 is equal to not a number. That's not really gonna work. Uh, the reason that is not going to work is not necessarily super important for us. The only thing that is important for us right now is that this does not work to determine if num2 is not a number. So we're gonna make use of a built-in function called is not a number. Say is. The fun part about this is there's actually two versions of it. One of them is attached to number. So number dot is a number is a function and so is that. What's the difference? Uh, there, well, I shouldn't speculate about that because there obviously is a difference or two, but in terms of the difference, uh, like a tangible difference, there really isn't one. So is not a number of num1 or is not a number of num2. And if either of those are the case, we're going to return not a number. Now, again, let's keep in mind that this may need to go first because if we check if num1 is zero, in the event that num2 is not a number, we probably want to return not a number. So we might want to put that up front, but it might not be the, uh, it might not be necessary. So let's get into how we would actually solve this problem. So modulo always returns the sign of the first number. That gives us a very nice idea of how to start, which would be create a result is positive uh, Boolean flag. Now we did this, I think, in some digits. And the idea here is that we're going to organize our approach so that we don't need to do anything different in the event that the numbers are negative or positive. The second number's sign doesn't matter, and the first number's sign just means that the answer is going to be negative. So we create a result is positive Boolean flag, and we check whether num1 is positive or negative. After we check that and we've saved the information, we make both num1 and num2 positive versions. Now here's, here's the difficult part, which is to say that coming up with what we're about to do is not necessarily something that is, put it like this, if you're unable to generate what we're about to do without having seen the solution somewhere, you don't need to put that like as a black mark against your possible development career. A lot of times if you get used to these patterns and you see them enough, you'll be able to sort out problems later that you wouldn't have been able to solve without uh, checking these sort of like patterns first. So 
what we're going to do is, let's say that we have, <clears throat> excuse me, the example up here, but we're going to change it to 15 and 4. So when I divide 15 by 4, the result is something like, what would it be? 2, 3 and 3 fourths, something like that? Yeah, 3 and 3 fourths. So what's happening there is, uh, well, this is one of those leaps where you kind of just like take my word for it that this is what's happening. What we're doing is we're going to subtract 15, 4 from 15 continually and keep subtracting 4 from the result until we get a number. That's, that's correct. Okay, one thing at a time. 7 minus 4 minus 3. Until we get a result uh, that is less than or... No, actually, it's got to be less than, right? If it's equal to... Yeah, we would want to do it again so it would get to 0. So if it's, if it's less than. So if we consider that this is num1 and this is num2, we're going to continually reassign reassign num1 to be num1 minus num2 until num1 is less than num2. So until is the opposite way of saying while. So that's essentially a while loop. Once we have that, num1 will actually contain the result that we want. At that point, we're going to check our flag. Check if result is positive. If it is, if it is, uh, just return num1. Otherwise, we know the result needs to be negative. And in the event that the result needs to be negative, we would just return uh, basically negative num1. And the reason that we're doing that is because we've gotten rid of the negative sign up front, but saved that information. And then at the end, we check to see if the result needs to be negative. If it is, we just apply a negative sign to it and return it, which will actually create the number for us. So create a result is positive Boolean flag. So we'll say variable result is positive. And we're going to set that equal to true to begin with. Then we need to check to see if num1 is less than 0. That's the case where we're going to need to reassign. Oh boy, what's happening? Yep. Uh, we're going to need to reassign result is positive to be equal to false. And you could do this as result is negative in the opposite fashion. The idea is that we want to be able to easily read this Boolean value and determine what it tells us about the logic inside of our function. So make both num1 and num2 positive versions. That's the same as the uh, math.abs or absolute value operator. And this is just going to give us uh, negative 7 and 7 will both yield 7 because it's essentially the distance on the number line as opposed to anything associated with magnitude. Um, no, it's just magnitude. It has nothing to do with direction. I forget the exact terms for that. But anyway, it's going to get rid of the negative sign if there is one, and it's not going to do anything if there is no negative sign. So num2 and num1 have now been reassigned to their positive values. And if we follow this pattern of num1 and num2, we want to reassign num1 to be num1 minus num2 until num1 is less than num2, which is what we did right here. So the way that reads in code is while num1 is greater than or equal to num2. Num1 is equal to num1 minus num2. Same thing as num1 uh, minus equals num2. Those both say the exact same thing. Don't say both or else you'll be a little bit off. Um, yeah, you'll be a little bit off. There's chances that you would have like an incorrect result if you did like that. But the way that we've done it here, this way or the other way that we just deleted will work. Well, we hope anyway. So the last thing that we're going to do is this if statement where if result is positive, and we can just do it like that because since it's a Boolean value, this is either going to be true or false, so that'll satisfy the if condition. And then if, I think this is where the else goes, yep. So if result is positive, then we just return num1 because num1 has been reassigned all the times until here, in the case that we did, it was 3, and 3 is the remainder of 15 divided by 4, which is what modulo is doing. And let's say we had negative 15, that would have result as positive is false, so the result is not positive. In that case, we're just going to return negative num1. Now, this is one of those problems where you are very, very likely to get an infinite loop. Anytime you're doing a while loop like this, you might get an infinite loop. When you get an infinite loop, just shut your browser down, open it back up, and don't run that same thing again. So, looks like we're good. We've got our edge cases. We may need to move this first. Uh, if num1 is equal to 0, return 0, which lines up here. If num... There we go. If num2 is equal to 0, return not a number. If either of them are equal to not a number, return not a number. Uh, 
result is positive. If num1 is less than zero, then result is positive instead of equal to false. Get rid of any negative signs. While num1 is greater than or equal to num2, continually reassign num1 to be whatever num1 was previously minus num2. And we do that until num1 is less than num2, which breaks the while loop. Then num1 contains a remainder, at which point we check to see if the result is positive. If it is, we just return num1 directly. If it's not positive, then we know the result needs to be negative and we return negative num1. So fingers crossed, run the test, and we're in good shape. So it looks like we didn't need to move this anywhere. Uh, that's probably a result of the tests not being possibly as robust as they need to be, but this problem's hard enough without any tests that mess with the edge cases. So, excellent work. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you in the next video.